Okay, rock and roll. It is Tuesday, October 24th, and this is the first of... Oh, we're getting things for this. Okay, yeah, I see what those readings are. That looks correct. Um, so this is Unit 5, first lecture, and we're on anxiety disorder, which is another particularly common reason for people to seek outpatient psychiatric care. Um, oh, 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 the DSM-5, DSM-5. Right. DSM-5, the only thing in DSM-5, Morgan, that you need to read are the diagnostic criteria, which is also available in SATIC. Because static for each of the disorders, they'll have that little box where it says the DSM-5 criteria for the, the disorders. And that's really what, right, whenever y'all are studying and starting a new unit, read static first because that's where you get information about, A, the diagnostic criteria. So how are you going to diagnose this stuff? What are the typical age of onset? Differences in representation by sex different comorbidities, what are different risk factors, what are um, the standard treatments, you know, the typical medications, but the treatment part's really vague, it's real brief. In oh, Lauren is asking about feedback. Sure, just to help everybody, anyone who's not wanting to ask a question, please mute your mic. Um, or if you're logging in by phone, please just mute your phone so that people don't uh, don't get distracted by that. Okay, here we go. Hopefully that helps. SADIC gives you information about the assessment and the diagnosis of these things. STAL is going to tell you about the physiology underlying the disorder and why the medicines work. Um, SADIC doesn't go into a lot of child detail. That's what the child psychiatry book is for, because that's a limitation that SADIC has. So I would really start with SADIC, then read, uh, then read Stahl, and then supplement your SADIC information with the child book. Take notes while you read. Listen to the lectures. Look at the PowerPoints. Let them kind of guide your note taken. Voila, the end. So anxiety disorders, it's probably, uh, as a whole, the most common psychiatric uh, disorders in kids. Maybe not the number one thing that brings kids to treatment or the, the most diagnosed thing, because that would be ADHD in little children's. Um, but anxiety disorders, it's one that may be more likely to present, especially phobia and GAD. Those things are often present from a young age, so and, and they tend to continue throughout the lifespan and can make people real miserable and make them want to seek treatment. It'll also make people want to use substances to cope and that's that's detrimental for a variety of reasons. Speaking of the DSM-5, we're going to start by going over kind of the place to start with these disorders is what's the primary feature? How would I know if I was looking at a person with with this disorder? So we start with the criteria. Panic disorder. Um, anybody here work with folks? Like, what percentage of your patients would you say deals with, with panic disorder? Any guesses? I'd probably say maybe um, maybe twenty percent. Karen saying, but yeah, in an outpatient setting, probably one out of five, one out of six something like that. And panic disorder is often comorbid with other things. Panic disorder is really crummy um, because it, it cohabitates with other disorders. You can imagine how panic disorder might contribute to a lot of isolation and, and the development of a depressive disorder as well. Um, so anyway, panic disorders, recurrent unexpected panic attacks. That's really what panic disorder is. Um, you used to require with or without agoraphobia. You don't have to do that anymore. 
and I think agoraphobia we may talk about in just a second. Um, yeah, in a couple of slides. But panic disorder and agoraphobia are two different things, but they often occur together. Panic, typical onset early 20s. Pretty young. Um, remember when that when the the complex uh, neural networks are really finalizing their connections and, and refining their their reciprocal activity. Early 20s, you'll have that. Comorbid with other anxiety disorders, you'll have GAD and panic. Um, you can have depression, major depressive disorder, and panic. And a lot of times, you'll have some sort of sedative use with this because physiologically that complements the other very well. Panic attacks in kids and adolescents is going to look real similar to a panic attack for an adult. Um, people will go through periods where they may not experience very many. The amount of situational stressors may prime the person to be more likely to have panic attacks. This is very uh, physically driven. This is largely a norepinephrine issue. So anything that lowers the threshold or um, kind of raises the baseline level of activity and activation just puts you closer to to that, that cutoff point. So while it is, it, you can say that it's a chronic disorder, but it, it almost goes dormant at times for people. So uh, something you may have to, it's why you have to assess for it specifically because the person may not be presenting with any symptoms or reporting that it's currently an issue. So this is a panic attack. Panic attack is not a, it's not itself a DSM-5 diagnosis. You can't be reimbursed for a panic attack. But this is what uh, panic disorder is really based on. It's an abrupt surge of intense fear with four more of the following symptoms. And when you look at this, okay, I, uh, my heart's beating really hard. It's beating really fast. I have chills. I'm sweating. I'm having trouble catching my breath. I kind of feel choked up. Some people will throw up. They'll complain of lower GI distress. What when you think division of the nervous system, which one do you think of with those? Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, sweating. Right, exactly. This is this is inappropriate recruitment of your sympathetic nervous system because something has been perceived as threatening. And the person may not even be aware of what it is. This may be kind of an internally triggered sympathetic overactivity. This is fight or flight that gets turned on when it doesn't need to get turned on. And if you remember from a few weeks ago, you have those noradrenergic, those norepinephrine neurons that uh, those, those guys innervate a lot of, um, uh, a lot of really basic brainstem functions like, uh, in your brainstem, which controls blood pressure, which controls um, uh, heart rate, which controls respirations, innervates the heart, innervates the skin, innervates the muscles, innervates the gut. That's why you have all of these physical sensations. And the, the amygdala is, when you read through Stahl, and Stahl's anxiety chapter is going to be really helpful with making sense of some of this that um, norepinephrine can be mobilized in multiple destinations. The amygdala, if fear is perceived, and the amygdala tells, okay, well, we need to launch a metabolic response to this. We need cortisol to increase. We need heart rate to increase. We need respiration, we need uh, the, the bronchioles to dilate, we need more oxygen to fuel our escape. That response is designed 
to last about 10 minutes. It's designed to get you away from the threat. So when people are talking about, oh, I just got so panicked and it lasted 30 seconds, that's physiologically, that's not how true panic works because this, this requires a mobilization of neurotransmitters and resources to last about 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes on the higher end because it's designed for the person to escape, to get away. So when you're, when you're assessing for this and people say, oh, I just got so panicked, it's really important um, to assess for duration and frequency and to, to really ask about, well, when you say panic, what, do you, what does that look like for you? How would I know you were having a panic attack? And let them describe to you what it is for them and not necessarily lead them because people might say, oh, yeah, I do that. I do that. I do that. Norepinephrine is very useful in some instances. It helps with sustained attention and focus. Um, it's good when you need to mobilize your whole physical organism to, to fight or to flee. But that system can be, um, hijacked is not the right word, but it can be initiated incorrectly, like through some of those, um, some of those, those neural networks that are established inappropriately. Things can trigger the amygdala to be inter to interpret fear and to launch to say, okay, locus ceruleus, let, let everybody go, let all the horses out. But it may not be an appropriate stimulus. It may be um, from a memory. It may be from an association. And the person might not even be aware of what does it. And with panic disorder, the person won't be aware of what tends to trigger it because these are, by definition, panic disorder by definition is untriggered panic attacks. They're not predictable. They don't know when they're going to happen. So the, the, someone with panic disorder is going to change their behavior and change what they do because they're so worried about this happening again. They often don't want to go into situations that raise their baseline level of anxiety that sort of get them on sub hyper alert, get some kind of a level orange, which means they're just that much closer to threat level purple when when they experience the full physiological um, uh, manifestation of this. One of the things that tends to trigger panic for people is a physical sensation that they're starting to have a panic attack. These folks are often very sensitive to um, internal uh, sensations, like to that interoception is your sense of you know, am I feeling anxious? Am I feeling keyed up? Am I being really in touch with, with how they're feeling? Sabina's saying self-fulfilling. In some ways, it can be because there's no real known trigger to associate this with. So what happens is the physical sensations of anxiety become the primer that the amygdala recognizes as the threat that can then initiate the whole the full response. So you'll have people who once they start feeling their heart rate going up, it is and it's at a subconscious like classical conditioning level that, oh, I'm starting to, to feel my heart rate's going up, I'm gonna have a panic attack. And that is the threat, and then the whole panic attack happens. Which is why it's so helpful for people with panic disorder uh, to teach them ways to, to lower their baseline level of anxiety, to teach them how to recognize it sooner, and then to behaviorally intervene so they don't stay in that, uh, in that state of awareness of hyperarousal, which leads to the full panic attack. And, and there is actually a part of your brain whose job is to monitor, constantly monitor internal sensations and determine if they require action or not. Are they normal? Are they healthy? Or is it not? And people with panic disorder tend to have a um, 
hyperactivity when you look at um, when you look at the insula its job is to to say oh is this normal is this painful is this good for me is this bad for me and then connect to other structures that say this requires a response it's why people with uh, performance anxiety quote unquote are so benefited by beta blockers because what is what does a beta blocker do physiologically? Pop quiz. Like a metoprolol or a beta blockers prevent yeah, it blocks adrenergic receptors, specifically um, beta-1 receptors. Um, yeah, exactly. Blocks beta-1, which is, you know, those that noradrenergic uh, neuron that's trying to get to the heart and prevent the AV node from slowing things down, your vagus nerve, innervates the AV node, the atrioventricular node, to say, slow down, slow down, slow down. Norepinephrine gets to the heart. It says, stop, parasympathetic system. Let's speed this heart rate up. So if you can block the heart's response to that norepinephrine, then you're blocking one of the main signals telling the person that, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm having a panic attack. So that's why a lot of people will do beta blockers for um, kind of as-needed performance anxiety. You might see beta blockers given um, just for the treatment of, of general anxiety. Um, yeah, you'll see propranolol used a lot, probably often with people who um, maybe can't tolerate for other reasons, people who can't tolerate benzos, some, maybe someone with a substance use history or some other contraindication that you would do. Um, yeah, propranolol can be helpful for um, for anxiety, for tremors. I think I have seen it used for migraines. Um, a lot of different things are used for migraines. They just don't know quite what to make of that. Because um, one of the ideas I think behind migraines is excessive uh, constriction. Some some of it is excess vasoconstriction in the brain. Others is it's excess vasodilation in the brain. I'm not not a migraine specialist. Um, but then you also have the the patient education that goes along with beta blockers as far as watching your heart rate. And don't take it if it's too low and then you'll pass out. So panic. This is a norepinephrine overactivity issue that is triggered largely by increased awareness of the physical sensations in the first place. And it makes people want to avoid situations in which um, if they have a panic attack, it'll be hard for them to get to safety. And that's what agoraphobia is. As you can see, it's real highly comorbid with panic disorder, and it makes sense. If, if I thought I might have a panic attack, I would probably not want... Um, okay, Kelly Hamill might be a migraine expert, and she says not successful in preventing them. Ha -ha. Ah, I see. Unfortunately, you are. You kind of have to know about migraine. Um, so you can see how if, if I'm worried I'm going to have a panic attack, I'm going to sweat and cry and shake and throw up and feel like I'm going to die. I probably don't want to go. I may not want to go out of my house ever because I don't know when this is going to happen. And panic attacks are probably more likely to occur outside of your home, outside of somewhere considered safe. Uh, and that will just make leaving your home uh, classically conditioned. If I leave my house, I have these things. Why well, don't I leave my house? Marked fear or anxiety in anywhere out in the public. This is difficult from claustrophobia where people feel trapped in and they're afraid they 
they can't get out because they're so trapped. This is not claustrophobia. This is fear, essentially, of being uh, out and exposed, out and at um, at risk, and having difficulty getting somewhere safe, somewhere hidden, somewhere. Uh, You know, where they can essentially reestablish safety and, and calm down the fight or flight response. No longer has any need. There are safety cues. That's why grounding is helpful for people in having panic attacks to just reinforce that they're, they're not dying. They are safe. And the symptoms have to be present for six months. So this isn't just a, for the last month, I've kind of been worried leaving my house. And the person actively avoids leaving the home. I'm getting a message on my computer that audio might be a little questionable for some people. So if it is, easiest thing is probably just log out, log back in, and it, a fresh connection should be established. Um, and you see that little note down there. This is a static sort of note. That typical onset is under 35, whereas panic disorders onset was usually around 20-ish. And then up to half of people endorse panic disorder prior to the agoraphobia. So some people will just stop going out before the real panic disorder symptoms uh, or, or diagnosis is established, but most of the time, at least in my experience, panic disorder precedes the agoraphobia. So when you're working with someone with panic, you want to ask them, how does this affect you? How's your life changed since these symptoms have started? Because you want to know how limited they are. Are they not leaving their home? Um, are there things that they avoid doing? Have they had to quit work? It sounds really terrible because they can't predict it. They cannot predict. It's feeling like you're going to die and you don't know when that's going to happen. And, uh, oh, yep, sure, telehealth might be an option for people especially if it lets them not have to go into some really busy, packed out uh, doctor's office. So agoraphobia is often comorbid with panic, but, it, but you can have panic disorder without agoraphobia. And you can have agoraphobia without panic disorder. But a lot of times the panic precedes it. So assess for the, the kind of impairment due to the to the disorder. So we're talking about phobia. And phobia just means fear. Phobia means panic sort of symptoms. But what makes it different is there is an identifiable trigger. That's criterion A of specific phobia. Essentially a, a particular thing predictably will initiate some kind of panic response or significant anxiety, fear, or anxiety about a specific object or specific situation. This is more static information straight from the DSM-5. So not only will, upon exposure to the trigger, there is a, almost always evokes a physiological, a fight or flight response, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the shaking, the fear, I gotta get out of here. Um, such significant distress that the person may dissociate, they may start, they may feel total numbness, they may have one of those quote unquote out of body experiences, like I'm here but I'm detached from my feelings, which we'll talk more about in the trauma um, and personality disorder material down the road. But you can essentially think of that as ineffective uh, an ineffective attempt at regulating this 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 uh, limbic 
emotional fear response. That the frontal cortex is actually trying to, to gain some control and shut those structures down, but it, it doesn't do so efficiently. It just sort of shuts down everything to where people don't even feel their bodies anymore or things are not familiar anymore. Have I been here before? This is weird. I feel weird. Um, so that sort of physiological response at exposure to a trigger. And it's a little more distress or impairment. It's, it's more fear than really ought to be, you know, appropriate to the situation. So it's very different from seeing a scary animal and being real scared. This is losing control, fight or flight kind of response. There are typical kind of causes of phobia. There's categories that most of them fall into. And they all relate. You know, these aren't cortical, high order thinking kinds of things. This is... I mean, think about old programming, the kind of the kind of programming and responses you needed to survive in, you know, the jungle or in the swamp or in the Serengeti. If you were a lower ordered creature, you would want to have fight or flight response to scary, threatening animals like snakes, like big dogs that were mean. Not all dogs, of course. Um, you would probably want to be activated if you sensed some sort of threat from the environment, like a tsunami or a tornado. Or so you can see there's there's survival benefit to having a fight or flight response to certain animals, to certain um, you know earthquakes. And animals act strange. If you've ever lived on the coast when a big hurricane's coming. Animals start acting funny because uh, they know they're programmed to seek safety in those times. Blood injection injury. This is, and what's interesting about this is uh, people with blood injury injection, blood injection injury uh, phobias tend to be the most physiologically activated by this. These are going to be people who vagal down when you draw blood on them. Uh, if they see, you know, a, a compound fracture, they're going to pass out. Uh, so that's just kind of an interesting tidbit on that, that people with blood injection injury phobias tend to vagal down even more severely. And then situational, which is when you're talking about, um, like, being in a tight room, claustrophobia, being on an airplane, that people panic at those. This is often present by age 10 and the most common types are animal blood injection injury. These are people who hate going to the doctor. They're scared to death. They're very upset in hospitals. They can't go in waiting rooms. Um, and interestingly to me, and this comes from SADC, that this is the most common anxiety disorder in women is specific phobia. I personally find that hard to believe, but that's what they say, so I'll go with it. So again, you have panic attacks that maybe are not due to a predictable exposure to a stressor like a spider or a snake or an elevator, like with a specific phobia, or it can be due to a, a predictably, reproducibly to um, to this exposure. And, and the underlying mechanism is really the same because it's this is physiological, this is norepinephrine, this is um, inappropriate interpretation of either internal stimuli or no, no, no detectable stimuli or a overactivation of the fight or flight response, which is going to be amygdala driven, which is going to be norepinephrine driven. Um,
So the treatments that Stahl will talk about, and I don't know if it's, I think it's the next, the next PowerPoint, and if not, we'll, we'll record a separate one as far as medication treatments. Uh, we do have a separate PowerPoint on why certain medicines help. Because you figure, if this is a norepinephrine issue, then providing medication that uh, essentially opposes norepinephrine. So we talked about those beta blockers. Sure, that can be one way. But these are hyperactive systems. There is excess activity and overactivation of these panic, uh, of the panic fear circuit. Stahl talks about the fear circuit, which is amygdala based. And norepinephrine uh, fueled. So if you're wanting to lower activity of hyperactive systems, then that's what GABA's job is. GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's going to reduce the frequency and uh, and power of these norepinephrine transmissions. It's just going to slow everything down. And that's why benzos are used especially in acute treatment of panic disorder because it physically inhibits, directly opposes the, the system driving it. But unfortunately, um, for long term, benzos are not indicated because A, it makes therapy more difficult because people can't unlearn triggers and relearn responses. They also develop tolerance to these things. So then, so then the absence of the benzo, the anxiety is actually greater. The physiological response is greater. Yeah, exposure therapy is, is really just about relearning to where a stimulus is paired without the fear response and the amygdala no longer activates that fight or flight response at exposure to that stimulus. But for that relearning to occur, um, there needs to be essentially new memories laid down and new associations paired together. And benzos, while they're great for reducing anxiety, also directly oppose that relearning process. Norepinephrine is actually also used in, um, in memory formation. So if you're just if you're blocking all kinds of norepinephrine, then that's going to impede learning and impede the the pairing of the new stimulus with with the response. So that's really the cost of benzos. It makes therapy difficult. It makes relearning challenging, if not impossible. But for acute management, maybe while you're waiting for an SSRI to uh, to become effective, you can you can make the you can just sort of prevent panic attacks while the SSRI is working to prevent them. SSRIs, SNRIs, are first line for panic disorder because something we mentioned before is serotonin has it has something to say on these circuits as well on the fear circuit on the, the worry loop that we're about to talk about. And serotonin is effective at decreasing norepinephrine output, and it's effective at decreasing dopamine output. And that's helpful for these folks with panic who just have norepinephrine kind of flying all over the place when you don't want it to be. But norepinephrine turns up GABA, which turns off norepinephrine. Stahl will talk about interneurons and it's essentially this itty bitty little neuron kind of that connects. Maybe two neurons don't directly connect to each other. Maybe there's a GABA neuron in between. So you turn serotonin up and you can turn norepinephrine down because you're turning up GABA which which is able to turn down norepinephrine. But that takes a while, like we talked about, two to four weeks. People can be miserable in the meantime. So short-term use of benzos may be helpful, 
while you're waiting for that down regulation to occur with the serotonin so then it can turn up and and improve GABA release and, and reduce the norepinephrine there. Stahl's anxiety chapter will just say that over again. So that's what he's talking about. Increase anxiety in the elderly. Boy. They're just really not the best. They're just not the best drug. Our bodies adapt to them. And then there's more trouble. And, you know, benzos also, I mean, it's that's going to slow down. That That's indiscriminate. That increases GABA everywhere. So people are going to have reduced reaction time. They're going to have reduced uh, attention, sustained attention. It'll be um, harder, uh, longer, more difficult to make decisions, to, to follow through on tasks, on, on multiple step activities, memories impaired. It's not necessarily the best thing. Certainly not long term. So we just talked about fear and more fear, and then some more fear, which again is hyperactivity in that amygdala fear circuit. Generalized anxiety disorder. When you work with people with GAD, the symptoms of generalized anxiety are very different. Look right here. Because these are the these are six symptoms of, of generalized anxiety. You actually see fatigue. You see trouble concentrating. This looks real different from the physiological symptoms of panic. There's no heart racing. There's no um, GI distress. There's no shaking, there's no sweating, there's no, I can't breathe, I feel I'm choking, that comes and goes, lasts for 10 minutes and then goes away. So this must be driven by a different system, and it is. Generalized anxiety is just a state, a chronically elevated state of worry. It doesn't come and go. It's most of the day. It's most days. For a long time, this doesn't come and go. This is this is a baseline level of operation for this person, and they can't control it. They try to get their mind off of it, but they worry about being late, paying bills, health, retirement, um, the health of their family in Iowa, global warming. I mean, it's everything. They're indiscriminate. It's indiscriminate application of anxiety that they can't control. That's not due to substance. It's not due to a thyroid issue. Um, someone was asking about, they, they, one of your classmates found a discrepancy in the SADC book about parathyroidism and anxiety. Uh, that was pretty astute. So hypoparathyroidism, so low low calcium is one of the many medical rule outs. Uh, so I say all that to say it's not substance. It's not medical. Um, and it causes significant impairment. People can be pretty miserable. The Beck anxiety inventory can be uh, a useful screening tool. For anxiety, there's also the GAD7 that I would recommend using in combination because the Beck anxiety is more physical, which may point you more toward panic, whereas the GAD7 is really just GAD. So when people say, oh, I've just been so anxious, you want to know, well, when did it start? Does anything make it better? Does anything make it worse? Are there any days when you don't feel anxious? How's your sleep? Do you find yourself having a hard time concentrating? Do you feel so tight that you get tension headaches and your neck hurts? Or are you sort of jumpy? Because GAD, it's not just feeling anxious. It's, it's the person's, the organism's physical response to that, to that state of excess alertness.
and you can see how it looks really different from Panic. Um, and folks are often, they will say, I've been this way since I was a kid. So I'll ask people, do you, do you consider yourself a warrior or do things kind of roll off your back? Because you don't want to lead people. They might say, oh, yeah, I'm a warrior. Give them an A or B, and they have to pick. And, uh, and have you always been that way? Or did it start, you know, when you were after you left home or after a stressor, that kind of thing? Wide range of onset, often pretty young. Women present more than men. Uh, and with women, they're likely to have comorbid depression, maybe comorbid panic. Men with GAD are likely to have a substance use disorder. Somatic symptoms versus hyperarousal symptoms. That there are physical manifestations of anxiety, particularly in young kids. Uh, stomach aches, headaches real common in kids because they, they have a harder time actually putting to words, oh, I feel so anxious. But you may have physical symptoms of anxiety in adulthood, so kind of look around for these things. But they're not going to endorse the panic kinds of symptoms. And kids, younger kids with GAD, it's going to manifest in ways that they can actually control. And kids who are you know, maybe uh, 7 to 12, 13, who are really focused on mastering school and being good at stuff and figuring out kind of their independent life because they're in school all the time. They don't have a parent with them all the time. They're figuring out their own way. They're comparing themselves. And how am I keeping up relative to my to my classmates and things. So their anxiety is going to relate to, well, how am I doing? Well, I did bad on that test. Or they'll worry about school and they don't want to be late to school. They don't want to be late to places. They'll want a lot of, um, you know, did I do okay? They might be like kind of teacher's pet E. They want, they want reassurance. They want positive feedback and they're really hard on themselves if they make mistakes that everybody else makes. So this, I was going to talk briefly before we wrap it up. We've got a few more minutes. That We mentioned that fear circuit. Let me see if I can pull something up right quick. La, 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 la. Wah, 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 wah. Found some really fun pictures. I'm going to pull one up. This is actually straight from stall. It's helpful. See if I can find I want to find the worry loop because we talked about the fear circuit. Hmm. Come hither. Here we go. Let's see if I can make this bigger or not. We're getting there. Haha. -ha. Voila. Okay. A new picture. This is a, a little picture, an animation straight from Stall, trying to depict different areas responsible for worry or for obsessive thinking. Because, you know, really there's there's overlap between a worry, which you might consider an obsessive thought, or even a delusional thought, and a worried thought. Now down here is where you would have um, the hypothalamus. You know, there's that, that panicked fight-or-flight metabolic response. Your brainstem where 
Um, norepinephrine is coming out and saying, hey, breathe, breathe more. Uh, we need more oxygen in. We need the heart rate to go up. None of those structures are involved in this worry loop here. The cortico striato thalamic cortical loop. It's a loop. And it's kind of funny because people, what's well, not funny, I don't mean to say funny, but folks who worry will talk about that their thoughts, it's like they're on a wheel and they just go and go and go. There's no start, there's no finish. They just go, 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 go. And the idea behind this is that there is inefficient information processing and uh, inappropriate connectivity between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is part of, I guess an oversimplification is this is responsible for sustained attention, kind of like what you're actually thinking about, what you're choosing to think about. Maybe your awareness, your consciousness, for the most part. That things that you think about, and, and we don't think about our actual thoughts as behavior, but they really are. It's a behavior. So people can be born this way. Absolutely. Oh, goodness gracious. Of course people are born this way. And remember, GAD kind of shows up fairly young. GAD shows up fairly young in some people who don't have a trauma history. Because this, this also looks very different from the circuitry and the connectivity. This is real different from what a brain looks like of someone who's been exposed to trauma. So it's a unique thing. And people can develop it in the absence of trauma as well. So you have someone, you're thinking about something. And like any good behavior, it travels, that impulse is going to connect with the striatum. Because the striatum, one of its main jobs is to filter out, okay, based on this thought or this intention, what do I need to do? I need to do this. I need to not do that. It's kind of a filter for selecting a behavior. And the, and we know about the striatum is even involved in selection of physical activity, physical behaviors. You have movement disorders, tremors, Parkinsonism, when there is striatal, um, insult, injury to it. So you kind of have this thought and then associated with it is maybe what I ought to do to achieve that thought or to achieve that goal. Well, let me, let me consult the thalamus because all incoming sensory information goes through the, the thalamus. So let me kind of temper what I think I'm going to do. And this is none of this is conscious. This is what your brain does when you're busy doing other things. Let me kind of consider some incoming sensory information to kind of fine tune what it is that I'm going to do. And then we're going to send that, that, uh, computer code back up to the front, back up to the cortex, and we'll actually, we'll actually do it. We'll, we'll, we'll say stuff, we'll do stuff, we'll think stuff. So the problem with people who worry is that this system, this system is overactive. So you have a thought that is associated with a behavioral selection. But that is not really well tempered by any other information. So you may come up with a thought that can run rampant because there is no other information being considered like this isn't. I probably don't actually need to worry about my aunt in Iowa who's in perfect health or I got plenty of money in the bank. I probably don't, probably don't need to worry about, you know, money or war. I really don't have any control over that. I'm actually sitting in a house in Alabama. I don't have actu any actual information telling me there is a threat out there. So there is, there are thoughts that are not uh, educated, they're not tempered at all by any kind of incoming sensory, any kind of other information. 
So they're able to just continue. Well, what am I going to do about it? Well, I have the thought again. Well, what am I going to do about it? The frontal cortex to the striatum. Thalamus isn't really saying. Yeah. Sure. Here's a solution. Quit thinking about that. You're done. You've arrived. You've thought the thought. You've arrived at a resolution. Turn out the end. When you think about delusions, that is a belief that's not based in reality. It's a fixed false belief, almost like the person's thinking is not being tempered or informed by any other information. The thought, the behaviors associated with it, repeat. The thought, behaviors associated with it, repeat. There's no consideration of what anybody else is saying, what any other data is indicating. It never reaches resolution. It never goes away. It just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. My mom is sitting in a house in Alabama worrying about my son in Olympia. Person got shot in Birmingham, Maryland, been this way all her life. Woo! I think if there's threats of gun violence, it would almost make sense for someone to be worried about um, about other people, which is really, that's the kicker with delusions. That's the kicker with generalized anxiety disorder, because often it's possible. The things that they're worried about technically maybe could happen. Delusional disorder is way more difficult to treat than delusions of, um, you know, grandiosity or aliens are common for me because when there's a little bit of possibility of it, it's like, oh my goodness, you just, you're not getting rid of that. You're just not getting rid of that. And, and Deborah's example is good that you have people for their whole lives. It's almost like they're finding something to worry about, which is, which is really the truth. They are, their brains are designed to identify problems and and they run a little bit hot, they're a little bit worried about it. It's like I gotta be doing something. What's the deal? What's the deal? I gotta be doing something. There's you know, folks with GAD, they're restless, they're often fidgety, they have a hard time sitting still. It's as though their striatum is kind of wanting to apply some sort of action, but there's really no action to apply because there's no actual current threat. There's no the thalamus isn't telling them, hey. Yeah, there is actually something you need to do. There's nothing to do. So what people do when they're anxious because it promotes survival is, well, maybe there is a threat out there. So let me attach my anxiety to something so I can really be on the lookout so I'm not caught off guard. And then when there is maybe a little bit of an actual threat to hang their hat on, whew, they're on it. So worry, is it's a loop. It's hyperactive, the thinking, what am I going to do about it? There's nothing to do about it. Ah, who cares? All incoming information tells me I don't need to worry. You can tell someone with GAD not to worry. You're wasting your time. <laughs> this is what they do. It is just what they do. So the good news is that cognitive behavioral therapy is really helpful with teaching people how to identify the things that they're worried about and really how to question the evidence, kind of do what, to a, to a certain extent, what the thalamus is not able to do, to really question the evidence about, is this something that actually needs to be worried about or is there actually no threat? And people can learn ways to calm themselves down and ways to interrupt this loop and distract themselves. And the GAD symptoms can reduce. GAD, though, is very difficult to treat. This is kind of how these people exist in the world. And medicines like SSRIs are, are helpful because they can slow down dopamine activity here in the striatum, which drives this behavior behavior. Keep thinking about it. Keep worrying about it. Keep thinking about it. Obsessive compulsive disorder, which is similar to this as well, um, can be helped with SSRIs. That's really 
first line for those, in addition to therapy, of course. But if you can drop dopamine, because dopamine is the main neurotransmitter operating in the striatum, maybe you can interrupt that do this, what you're going to do, what you're going to do, what you're going to do, got to do it, got to do it, got to do it. Then you can maybe interrupt this link in the loop. Um, and also some, an interesting thing that Stahl will talk about is um, warriors versus warriors with this um, the catecholomethyltransferase enzyme whose job is to actually try to clear out dopamine from the brain. It's one of the enzymes that, you know, dopamine gets released in the, in the synapse and what doesn't get picked up, it can't just sit there forever. It needs to get cleaned up. So the COMT enzyme is a way to kind of break it down. But there are two genetic variants of um, there are two genetic variants of this enzyme, one of which the person ends up with maybe too much dopamine, and the other one, the person ends up with not enough. So while, while dopamine and, um, while dopamine and norepinephrine are helpful for learning and attention and, and interest and energy and these kinds of things, too much can contribute to excess dopamine in the system and some hyperactivation of the system, kind of like what we were just describing, that too much, the circuit never shuts up, it never hits release, it never reaches a resolution. Because some people under stress, they do much better. And some people under stress do much worse. They actually have reduced cognitive functioning, reduced attention, reduced problem solving, disorganization. Um, and that, that has been linked to differences in dopamine activity, that if people have too much already, they don't need more. And again, that's eh, we'll, we'll talk about that really more so in the schizophrenia chapter because this is... This enzyme is relevant also in schizophrenia. Voila! Okay, so it's 8.05, and we talked about panic, phobia, and GAD. We talked a little bit about kind of the, the physiology underlying panic versus the physiology underlying GAD, why, um, Reducing norepinephrine activity, maybe by boosting GABA or just slowing down or, or boosting serotonin, why that can help panic after two to four weeks. And why increasing serotonin and its uh, inhibitory effect on dopamine, how that might help not only GAD, but also OCD. Next week. We'll talk about some other anxiety disorders, in particular, um, blah, blah, blah. separation anxiety disorder, more common in kids, but also can happen in adults. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Separation. Social anxiety disorder, which used to be called social phobia, no longer is, is now social anxiety disorder. What distinguishes that from performance anxiety? And we'll talk about OCD, even though OCD is no longer considered an anxiety disorder. It's treated with similar medicines, so we're going to just include it in the anxiety unit. But OCD is, is no longer thought of. It's really conceptualized very differently in the DSM-5, that this is an Sure, it, it is likely to cause some distress and cause some anxiety, but it's the compulsions are, are no longer considered really driven by the anxiety that the obsessions cause. So that, that's a pretty significant shift. So that's it, everybody. Again, um, any other questions you have, email us. If you want to do a test review, email us, and we will get it done.
But um, yeah, thank you all so much for your attention and for coming early to go over the test review. We'll make those grade revisions in the next few days, so just check back in maybe over the weekend. Um, email us questions, and you all have a very good evening.